Well, thank you, David, for inviting me. Um, and I, before I start, want to thank even people in this room. John Headley's done very seminal work. Kurt Mobley as well. Uh, with the formation of hydrolite. I don't know if any of you have tried to put a bottom reflectance in hydrolite, but it's really helped bring the, for the field forward. And so I just want to say, and many, many other colleagues, so this is a, a group effort um, to sort of stretch the limits of what we can do with remote sensing. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah? Okay, so my, my background, and I will do it from a remote sensing perspective. <laughs> uh, see if you can identify these horrible locations. I've sadly been stuck in dark rooms my whole life. Um, so this is the first one. Um, so from above, this is Hopkins Marine Station. I was an undergrad uh, at Stanford, and they have this very nice marine station here in Monterey Bay, which is where I first, coming from Minnesota, one wants to be an oceanographer. Um, so we did a lot of fun work with diving and um, we studied sponges. So I, I got my first taste of the benthos off these nice rocky cliffs of California. Um, then I decided after doing some consulting I would go to this also horrible spot. Um, this is the University of California Santa Barbara. Uh, a lot of for uh, well-known ocean optics. My advisor was Ray Smith, who you might see his name, Smith and Baker. Uh, Dave Siegel was on my committee. So, um, you know, I, I uh, got a very good ocean optics background in this also lovely setting of Santa Barbara Note. There's some sediment plumes from the surf zone. And if you like to surf, that's where you would go. Uh, then I was a visiting scientist, and many of you have been down here, Stephanie included, at Rasmus at the University of Miami. And you can start to see slight differences in water color. This clearly is an oligotrophic <coughs> sandy bottom, different light field uh, versus Santa Barbara, and definitely than the dark waters of Monterey Bay. Um, and I worked there with uh, several other people, Bob Evans and so forth. Uh, then I became a postdoc at this back to Monterey. Um, this is uh, Moss Landing Marine Labs, and I also was a postdoc at Ambari, which is this building here. Uh, the Monterey Canyon comes up, so you can get really deep water very soon. Um, probably one of the most well-studied bays in the world. And now I'm sadly at this spot. No, this <laughs> another lovely spot. My office is right here. Um, this is the University of Connecticut Avery Point, uh, lighthouses, it's in Connecticut, so please, I mean, Henry's been to visit, a few of you have been around, but uh, come visit anytime you're between New York and Boston. Just swing by, for sure. You can find me on this floor, or email me. Okay. Uh, so that's supposed to say research in bright water. I sort of mentioned that earlier. And here's a whole bunch of things that we work on in our bright water um, studies, including white caps, sea ice. We've been doing some work on floating vegetation. We've done some nice uh, work recently on marine plastics. Um, red tides, I was, we just had a paper on that with um, seeing yellow fluorescence from space. Uh, it was in uh, PNAS. Sediments, bubbles, uh, coccolis, we're starting to do some work on that in the Southern Ocean. And today I'm going to talk about this little box. So hopefully um, you guys will get an understanding of uh, what we call optically shallow water. Oh. So um, this is us. I'm going to show you a little video of us doing some measurements. One of my uh, grad students, Brandon Russell, who is continuing our work with um, corals. Um, and so this is a compilation of a lot of people in my lab, which we call Colors, the Coastal Ocean Lab for Optics and Remote Sensing. Um, so just a, a picture from space. You know, it's pretty clear. There might be some optically shallow water here. Yeah, you're all looking that way. Um, Obviously, 
when you look at a modus chlorophyll product, if this doesn't get masked, it's really probably not indicative of chlorophyll. Anyone been to the Bahamas? Yeah, there's so much phytoplankton you can barely see. Yeah. Right. No, it's really clear water, but often either this gets masked or it, they derive products over little pieces of this. Um, we still don't handle optically shallow water on the big scale. This is a modus image. So this is this obviously best test case spot. So most of our seminal work on benthic remote sensing has happened here in the Bahamas. Clear water, less than five meters, and a bottom that shines from the space station to Mars. Um, so yay, here we go, one, that's where we've done a lot of work. I'm gonna present some data from number two. Anyone know where this is? Florida Keys. Another pretty nice spot along here. Um, you know, we have corals and then we also have seagrasses. Pretty mixed water column. This little spot, I'll show you one graph from that. It's called St. Joseph Bay, a uh, very conservative part of Florida, the state. We went here to Port Aransas. We did some work with sediment-laden waters. Uh, Mike Twardowski was there as well as part of one of our Navy projects. And literally, there was so much sediment, you couldn't see your hands underwater. Do you, you remember that cruiser? So then we also, I'm going to show you a little data from here. This is um, Elkhorn Slough, which is at the base of uh, the Monterey Bay. So all these places have sea grasses, which is what I've been mainly studying, but also corals. Um, and I'll just to wet your whistle, my first study was on the Bahamas banks. And you got to have to just start to ponder what these green, green spots are. Um, because as I'll explain in the later lecture, maybe they're not as obvious as everybody likes to look at pretty pictures, but what is a pretty picture? We, we, we really don't know. So I just want to throw in why habitats are important. Um, we call it optically shallow water when it's generally considered a contaminant. It gets thrown out from the modus products. We don't really like it. But actually, we found now that it, you know, it actually has uh, important properties that can be relevant to ecological habitats. So, you know, we care about fisheries, we care about uh, biodiversity, and we don't even understand carbon cycling in these shallow banks of bays. So, um, recently we've been talking about some, has anyone heard the term blue carbon? Yeah, it's kind of hip and trendy, but it's very true. If you get rid of seagrasses, they have carbon that's been stored for centuries in the soil, goes back into the water, can go back in the atmosphere, and Stephanie can model that for you. Um, so it's just, we're just exploring the tips of this. Now, um, I put the Danish flag because um, my first ocean optics conference a few years back, many years back, um, <laughs> uh, there is a Danish, famous Danish Jerlof, we all know him, and Hoyerslev, also a Danish, um, researcher, he would always come to the meetings and harass young grad students. Um, and so he would say, the Danes did this 50 years ago. So I would always throw in a slide on, look, the Danes did this first years ago. Uh, but you know, in 1918, there's a very nice paper, I can give you a copy, he did seagrass production over 2,000 square nautical miles. And he said the production was four times the quantity of hay just to give you a sense how productive, how much carbon. Seagrasses are incredibly rich in carbon. Now it's largely disappeared. The waters are too eutrophied. There's too many nutrients. And if you just take a graph, this is the best case of what we think the global area, for example, of seagrasses is. It's a, within over a factor of three. We don't, we don't know. How much seagrass is in the world today? Th factor of three. That's a huge difference, right? Some habitats, salt marshes, again, we don't know. Um, there's still 
a lot of work that needs to be done. And we have these assets in space, and we have the technology. And I'm going to show you where we're going with some of this to actually um, say something meaningful about the seafloor. OK. Is it possible to get a little water, someone? OK. So what's on the seafloor? What do you think? You, your best guess. Like, name something you think would be interesting to learn about on the seafloor. Seagrasses. Seagrasses, right. So is every seagrass similar? We don't know. We say seagrass. How about any other bottoms you're interested in? Corals. Corals. So I saw a lot of beautiful corals up in the Norwegian fjords. I did, cold corals. So when we talk about the bottom, we often put in our own, you know, I like a coral, I want sand, I want seagrass. But habitats are very difficult to classify. And fortunately, I haven't had to do this myself. Um, here, we can move this. Um, so before you venture into shallow water optics, I, I suggest that you guys um, spend a little time looking at what comprises the seafloor. Because it's very helpful. And in the US, you're required by mandate, sort of, to actually commonly uh, use some kind of classification system. And the one that we've been using recently is called CMEX. You can go to the website. Uh, I'm sure the European has some equivalent that where they've tried to classify every habitat of the world. Um, so it's a classification standard. So this is kind of helpful because you'll sort of see where other communities are interested and how they classify the geoform, that's the geology, the substrate, in this case they have seven, and some biotic components. So the seafloor can have all these things, right? Is it a fringing reef? That's the geoform. Is it in sediment that's considered boulders? Like, I mean, the beach off here is one of these. We could probably find that. And then the biotic, it can be on top of the sediment. And so I have uh, constructed different levels for this new project we're doing on coral reefs. And I pulled out what our groups need to sort of you don't have to fit every column, but um, in biotic, they have benthic. That means it's on the seafloor. And it's reef. And it is not Norwegian cold coral, because then you have to further say it's a shallow mesophotic coral, or shallow or mesophotic. And then you can have your biotic group. So coral is great, but are we talking encrusting coral, massive coral, plate corals, mixed corals, branching corals? and then if you can even go further and do species, that's even better, right? So it's just worth taking a look. If you're going to go in the field, know your categories and do the best you can to be compliant. It's not perfect. And you can say question mark, question, take a picture. Um, a lot of things are mixed. And we'll find that makes things challenging. Macroalgae. Is it calcareous algae, coralline algae, filamentous, leathery? mesh bubble, you get the picture. This, the seafloor is as diverse as anywhere you're going to go. So take the time, figure out your groups ahead of time, get familiar with them, so that when you're underwater and looking at something, you can be like, OK, these are what we're expecting to see. Talk to a, a benthic ecologist, for example. So anyone figured out from this what our beaches are here in Villefranche? Of <laughs> course, gravel, pretty much. Um, so it depends. And you sort of need to know, like I'll show you a case of Elkhorn Slough. It has mud, like the finest. And there's parts of the, uh, the Bahamas Bank that are the finest muds you'll find. 
Um, and so these are not developed by biologists, by, by geologists. So if you want to work with them and you just say, it was sediment, they'll be like, OK, thanks. Like, can you be more specific? So just keep in mind, these they do these with filters often, but you know, the uh, success of filtration. You might want to take a sample home and just be able to say, is it, which category is it? So this is a beautiful mosaic we just finished in Hawaii, uh, Eric Hochberg's group. And you can see these are little bars put out by the diver. I'll show you later a picture of, so they're this big. And then they dove along for reference, little bars. Um, and then they're able to sort of swim along this way. So is it easy to work and locate yourself underwater? You shake your head no. You get your little cell phone out? No. GPS doesn't work underwater, right? So there's huge challenges to trying to understand the benthos, to validate, uh, to figure out a strategy. So this could be one of our pixels from an aircraft. And then you're saying, is this coral or is this sand? Or figure out a percentage. Um, so this scale here is about like a bar like this. Yeah. Um, so these techniques can be nice because the public likes to see this. They're like, ooh, three-dimensional coral fields. It's also helpful because, well, someone says, what's the bathymetry here? Well, I can guess it's different if I'm here or if I'm there by quite a bit, right? So your bathymetric models kind of depend on what's on the bottom and, and the, the texture. So we start to kind of move into fields of remote sensing that people use on land. Um, and so it helps because we have cameras. And I'll show you when we're diving. We take pictures of everything. Because for us, you know, that's cheap and it's fast. And if you don't know what you're seeing, you can at least validate it later. So this is a great mixture. We got corals. We have some encrusting corals, differently colored corals, and light blue sand. I'm seeing a lot of light blue sand. OK, so the other thing is sand isn't light blue, right? But your head doesn't think it's light blue, right? So when we talk about benthic reflectance, we're not talking about the actual color of the seafloor. We're talking about its reflectance in terms of normalized percentages of light. So um, you, you wouldn't just take a radiometer and go blue, 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 yellow, blue, blue, and say that's, that's re reflectance. So today I'm going to talk about some of the different benthic reflectance properties. And then I'm going to um, talk about how to measure them. Um, and then hopefully a little bit of time on, even without remote sensing, if you just want to hop in the water, what can we do with benthic reflectance? Can we say anything about it? Um, so mostly, you guys probably were thinking, we simplify the problem. Uh, the project we're doing now, we have three main targets, coral, sand, and algae. But I'll tell you, there's some corals that look like algae. They're, gargan they're green. So the thing is, if I didn't write what kind of coral, and I just went down there and I said, that's a coral, and then we misclassify it, it doesn't help me to know like what actually was it and how did I classify it, right? So again, go back to those classification habitats. And if this is your field, become an ecologist. Uh, fit, uh, um, species, know all the species you can, just be as familiar with your environment so that you can actually say, well, that was a, a Gorgonian of this size shape. OK, so lecture two, I'm going to talk about the remote sensing. But right now, just the factors that go into it. You know, a lot of, a lot of women like pink. We're our pink pink likers. I think there were a few. 
Um, obviously, this is another point. This dress isn't pink, right? If you said that pretty pink wedding dress. So reflectance is an inherent. This is obviously white, right? But depends on the light field. So our measurement and benthic reflectance then is not really what we see. It's actually what is inherent, what percentage of light comes off the target. OK, Henry. I said I would pick on him. What color is sediment? Pick one. White. OK, that's an easy one. What, you want to come up and draw the benthic reflectance of, of white sediment? All right. Just because it's late, it's good to move a little. All right. We'll call this R with a B for benthic. And you can put your own units if you wish. Um, so if I go to that nice light blue sand we saw, what do we think it's going to look like? All right. What? And what, what, what number is that? What's uh, the maybe, range? What's the range we're looking at? Well, some percentage range, so 10. 10%? Seven. OK. So you think sediment is a 10%. All right. If this is one, OK, you may go. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so that's one that sense, but we'll, we'll show you some examples. Anyone want to show me, is there a different color sediment might be? Your favorite color? Brown. All right. <laughs> what does brown look like? Uh, in what sense, in that sense? Yeah, you know. Have you ever put a speck on a brown thing? A spectrometer and measured ah. brown. Your favorite uh, yeah. color? I can go in brown. OK. <laughs> Let's do brown. Because I, I guarantee you there's 20 people that don't know what brown's going to look like, right? How many have no idea what brown would look like? A few, yeah. What does a brown look like? Something like that. And it's a lot brighter than white sand. Uh. Saturation. <laughs> <laughs> wow, sorry. I had to risk it there. OK, so maybe something like this really bright brown. And the sand is more like, what, if, what would this maybe be like gray? That's a 10% gray. Spectralon is a 100%. So OK, but something. And you're saying it's kind of going red, because brown is, brown is actually a dark red. OK, so when red gets really dark, it's brown. So you're absolutely right. So we go down there, and then you get out hydrolyte. And how many, how many sediments do you have, Kurt? Oh, I'll give you a dozen or so sort of typical ones. Yeah. So there's only a dozen sediments in the world, and you have to kind of know what you're going to do, right? OK. So just to make it clear, reflectance is EU over ED. Uh, it's a percent, essentially, a little bit different from how we use it. Um, independent of the light field, and it's not really what we're seeing to our eye, because we're not going to talk about it here. But I think those of you who want to do benthic stuff or this kind of work should be crossing over into ecology and other geology. And it's really cool to study, actually, what that coral looks like from my eye what it looks like from some. So we have these three cones, right? Blue, green, red. Um, and so like Colin Russler and I have done a lot of work on red tides. And they don't peak in the red. And you'll never see them very seldom peak in the red. But because this red cone is really centered over here, something starts to poke out a little more in this spot, we can see it as red, right? Because this mutation is what is missing. If anybody here, uh, green, blue, uh, green, red, colorblind, yeah. So you can't see these are two different colors. Yeah, sometimes. Because you're missing one of these, right? So the world looks probably more enhanced. I don't know. All right, so now if you were a mantis shrimp, this is how many cones you have underwater to see the world. 
So we think we're so highly evolved, right? Woo, we see so well, except like a fraction of what some organisms can see. And Kurt has a paper now on vision that maybe submitted. submitted. I'll talk about, I'll show you one figure of it tomorrow. What's happening at 320? Is there anything to see there? Uh, <laughs> apparently, and I'm not sure why they have such good UV vision. I mean, shallow water, and they're either using it internally so creatures can use it off each other to communicate or get predation off other organisms. Uh, there must be something to see or they wouldn't have cones here. Flowers, I think that bees have UV vision. Because yeah, but this, this is underwater. So you, there's not a lot, but apparently it's useful enough, right? They have um, polarization sensitivity in some of those, maybe. I think the mantis shrimp can see polarized light in some, maybe those ones. Maybe then they, they're able to see even less of the light that isn't there. Um, yes, and then there's polarization, which is one thing we've been studying off a lot of fish of that, which is something we don't even see, which is the angles uh, of the way the light comes off of uh, the environment. So basically, you know, we want to sort of, based on your question, if you're going down to study the benthos, you better sort of do all the bands because even though organisms can't see them all, it's relevant to questions of how you look, who's seeing you ecologically. And I'll tell you that it's, it's incredibly important in terms of optically shallow re remote sensing. Okay. So here's some examples of some sediments. Um, these are some sediments in the Bahamas banks. Um, we have not 10%, but 30, going up to 40, 50% for some of these white uh, sediments. And then we have down to 10% for this white sediment. But this white sediment actually is covered with a green biofilm. So now we have biota on top of sediment, both kind of interesting and giving color. And I'll show you later this afternoon what this looks like from space. I thought this was seagrass from space until I went there and I was like, oh no, it's diatoms. Mm. No. <laughs> so um, you really have, this is a huge problem, picking out what we would call in the remote sensing world an end member. What is my sediment for this area? So you better kind of know what you're looking at. Now how ubiquitous, how common are these? So we can go to Florida Bay. These are some cores. You can see kind of a brighter white one. This is off shelf. And then you can go into the more rich seagrass beds. And you've got dense seagrass sediment, which is often darker. So if you go to just any spot and you say, this sediment here is nice and white. So I'll use that in my inversion over seagrass. But when you get to them, the dense seagrass beds, your sediment has thick, organic, dark stuff in it, and it looks more like this. So even the biota can influence the color. It's not, not quite so simple. And then this is that Elkhorn Slough, which is like dark, dark, dark mud. Really the darkest sediment I've ever found. It's like inky black. Um, and I'm going to show you that we were able to retrieve seagrasses even in this really inky, black, turbid environment. So we're making progress. That's, it looked very dark, although there's some glint. All right, so now we've sort of talked sediment. Um, it's really simple. Oh, what's, what's this? That's not here. OK, so when there's something that in a reflectance, when you're in reflectance space, not absorption, a dip means there's something absorbing. And a peak can mean two things. One thing is it could mean there's a minimum in absorption, uh, and it makes an artificial peak because you're absorbing on this side and this side. Or it could mean fluorescence. So 
you, you, when you start looking at things in reflectance space and you see a dip, you're like, something is absorbing. Any idea? It's around 6, uh, 70. Right. <laughs> so you could do remote sensing of the benthos here. And technically, you could look at the, this dip and try to relate it to chlorophyll on the sediment. You know, you could say, yeah, there, obviously there's some, set, some absorption of chlorophyll, and there's sometimes not. So kind of an interesting uh, study. This is Florida Bay. Um, so we're going to move to the color of things like seagrasses. And I can't take you there. Sadly, if we could, we'd put masks on. How many of you have seen seagrass off the coast here? Most of you. If you haven't, grab a mask. This is what it looks like. So you can see the light field is incredibly constant, huh? Right, Kurt? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Now, is this real or was this simulated by Headley? <laughs> <laughs> this is actually uh, real. So this is a uh, remora. So there's all sorts of cool organisms that he thinks Chris would be a good ride to the Bahamas. He's ready to. It's. It can be kind of dangerous under there. Clearly, this fish is not trying to camouflage, but he's very persistent. So I think the only time I've screamed underwater, that's me, is when it tried to, out of the blue, tried to attach to my lip. And I just saw this thing come out, and ugh, it kind of hurt. It was rough, but I lived. So. OK, so what I'm doing here is high-tech science. We're marking growth, so just like how fast does your grass grow. We can come back and measure. So we fill a little bottle with air, and then you put the cap on, and you, you mark these strings, and then they float. So later on, it's very cheap bucket ecology in the water, right? So if air is free, and then you can come back and you can measure growth rates. Uh, there's also another method where you poke a hole and you measure how fast the hole moves um, from the base. So there's a whole bunch of ways to study seagrasses. Um, but what you note here is the light field is quite variable. This is shallow. You get those capillary waves, very challenging to deal with. Um, and the seagrass has two species. So this one is thick-bladed thalassia, and this is cylindrical weedy, very weedy. Um, it's called syringodium. OK, so but this is more off in near coral reefs, you often get less dense uh, benthic reflectance. And so this is thalassia that's clearly quite different looking. Um, and you would kind of, what, what is the benthic reflectance of this image? Say you had a radiometer above it, you would kind of need to know the aggregate of what the sand is, what the leaves are. And then you're le these are epiphytes or sand that covers them. So you're almost always going to slightly overestimate the sand component because we don't clean sea grasses, right? So they're kind of dirty and messy. So that's errors of, as well. So in this case, here's what a seagrass leaf looks like. It has a nice rounded bump, and it skyrockets into the near infrared. I don't show that on this grass. but. Um, then we have sand, which has a little dip of chlorophyll here. And it's actually quite bright sand, bright white, brighter than I showed you earlier. Um, and then you actually do a little image analysis, say how much, just as is a little two-component model, figure out the area of the leaf that's there and the area of the sand. And then you can come up with an average that, say, an imager might see. That's another reason to take good pictures, because you can actually use them for data after the fact. So seagrass leaves are green. I don't know if any of you knew that. But uh, let's take another look at some other things. Now, these, this is a mixed canopy down in Florida. There's corals. So we have a site. We have hard bottoms, gorgonians, volcano sponges, which I obviously have affinity for the sponge. 
uh, Cleona, hard bottom, then we do some image analysis. And you can see these are all different reflectance spectra from sediment, hard bottom, down to pretty dark corals. So corals, kind of diagnostic, have this little double peak here. Um, and you kind of, if you see this double peak shifted over towards the red there, uh, it's pretty commonly diagnostic of coral. Um, but Gorgonians don't have that as much, and they're the sea fan, which is also coral. So it would be worth noting. Now I took this picture here in the background in Florida. We went down under, and those are all Gorgonian sea fans. Um, and there was some brain coral beneath it. Um, but you can see this is pretty different than what you might think of if you're thinking coral reef, right? The organisms living there. So it might be note, you, you might want to note the heights of the canopies, not only just the color, and maybe something about the 3D structure. And then you ask John Headley to make a nice model of the light field of this crazy canopy. But just to give you, it's always going to be an approximation, right? These things are three-dimensional. They have BRDFs, which means they have light scattering and different, because it's a tree, it has different scattering properties. Um, and we, all, we try to simplify that. We say sand, coral, not like cold coral, but shallow tropical coral, and the third member, algae. That's most common. Um, my colleague, John Headley, has this nice paper of uh, remote sensing. And he did a lot of sensor optics implications. And basically, the two main limitations were not sensor design or errors in uh, sensor, but were spectral variation and benthic types and sub-pixel mixing. Am I in the main conclusions? Yeah, that's right. That's, that's, yeah. right. So just keep that in mind. That's going to always be a limiting factor. So my student, Brandon, has this recent paper uh, just out this year. Um, and so this is the first time also a coral, what gives a coral color, right? It's an animal, but it photosynthesizes. So that's kind of weird. Um, so it has pigments inside, and there's different symbionts. And some of them are thermally tolerant. So if you can say, hey, I have a spectral marker for a, a symbiont, and it actually is thermally tolerant, then I can say this population might handle conditions of bleaching better than this other one. So we went out, and our, my colleague, again, it's funny because we were talking at dinner. Like, you guys will all probably be writing proposals together. Todd was at graduate school in ecology when I was there, and so we started working together. Um, he does uh, DNA stuff. So we had these controlled experiments, the same corals, but two different symbionts. And another species of coral with those same two different species of symbionts. One symbiont liked the offshore clear water, and one liked the near shore. So these are two different Cerelia and Rugosa with two different symbionts in each one. And these are the reflectance spectra we got. Dimitri, what do you think that is? I think <clears throat> this is fluorescence. Excellent. So you might know chloro uh, corals have green fluorescent proteins. And every now and then, you'll see a fluorescence hump in your spectra. Do you use that? I don't think so, but I don't know, right? These were in a laboratory setting. Maybe they got more light than they're used to. But you'll see it in the field sometimes, or you'll not. So it's a choice to make if you're solving for this part of the spectrum. Just be advised. There's often a little peak there. So often, we say differences. One way to look at it is derivatives, where little dips and peaks due to absorption can actually uh, be more closely observed. And if we look at the two species, in fact, except for that, they were identical. So 
sadly, so far it doesn't look like, I was thinking in my head, oh, it would be cool, we could say Trenchii has this little different pigment and we'll be able to help the coral reef community walk, dive around with spectra or from space and we'd be like, this one has the thermally tolerant version, but sadly no. But it might work some places. This was in Palau. Um, we're going to be redoing it in Hawaii. And John Headley's going to be modeling. So there could be some little aspect that we overlooked. But so far, it doesn't look like there's an obvious spectral difference. The good news is you can probably put in an average coral in your model and get a pretty good idea of coral overall. Yeah? So that's a good end member. Sediment, you got to know if you're bright white to dark milk coral. That's pretty similar. So you're good. Seagrass, I don't know if I showed it, but we've looked at all the different species, and it's pretty consistent as well. All right, so let's get to techniques. How do we know all this cool stuff? Uh, I have to say I recommend doing it in water. Um, you, you won't perturb biofilms. Some things require hydration. There's water in the pores of the sediments. If you take it out, um, you can get canopy architecture. You can't get that if you just grab a leaf. Uh, flow can affect this. Uh, and if you, you do sediment cores in air, there's differences in the index of refraction of the light than the lamp fields that you use. And it's a little bit more, you might get a good shape but you won't get a very good magnitude because you, you'll have to do some nice modeling to figure that out. And glint. Glint is always a problem when you're benthic reflecting as well. Um, in the water, the light tends to be a little more diffuse, and so it kind of spreads. You don't see as obvious a glint, but we'll, we can talk about that a little bit. Um, so. Here's one of the instruments. One of my mentors, Dick Zimmerman, <clears throat> built this piece of beautiful piece of work. Um, so in the early days, PVC, you can do a lot. He taught me how to put together PVC. <laughs> and uh, in this case, I'll show you. This is maybe a little less nice condition, but um, here he is getting it to work. He is doing a canopy level measurement. OK. That's the official pencil move. So now this is a, a downwelling light, and on the back side is upwelling light. And now he's recording on paper. And this is what the bed looked like, which is kind of uh, aging thalassia with some syringodium there. And it's not super clear. All right, so canopy level reflectance. Uh, this is our version. We have an up and a down. Um, and it's more of a handheld number. Uh, I just built this uh, with its own little housing. Uh, works with like a jazz spectrometer. You might want to enhance the light field. We're, we're trying to come up with some lamps. But it works really well in nice sort of uh, well-lit waters. And the reason, anyone know like an up and a down, why you would have a wand like that? Yeah, just, yeah, like this in a canopy. You can actually profile light through the canopy. You can get the top of the canopy. But how do you get sediment with that? Anyone, if I have a wand and up and down, and I want to get a sediment reflectance? Put it down, because there's shadowing, and now your measurement's on the ground, right? How do you do it? Yes? Two. You do it with two? You tilt? Yeah. 
Well, that's good if you're a fish because fish see the world from the side. And if your question is predation and camouflage, you'll be taking a lot of side measurements. We just did a study for the Navy and we have this nice paper. But remote sensing so far, we sort of want to see what's straight down because that's where we're. And if you tilt an, a cosine collector this way, it's pretty, pretty, I don't know, Kirk could tell us more, but that would give us something funky. It'd give you a horrible mess if you wanted to compute it from the radiance distribution in hydrolyte, because then you have to integrate over this yeah. hemisphere face for that. Cosine. It can be done, but. But why? Okay, so one way is then you, you could model it, right? You would take one measurement and you'd know the height exactly, and another measurement and you'd know the height exactly, and then you know the K of the water, and then you are able to sort of say, well, my downwelling would have been this, and my upwelling would have been this, and you sort of invert it, which, which is okay, but you have to have a pretty precise KD because these are uh, coastal waters, and then you're sort of modeling it, and there's some assumptions about, you know, AOPs and IOPs, and it can be a little complex. Anybody have another idea for how you would do this? A mirror. A mirror. Yeah. See, I love talking. There's always good ideas. You would. Yeah, but you're losing some of. Yeah. You, you are adding some optical paths, so you should be better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So no, we don't use mirrors yet. But fish are, we just have a paper in science, Mike and I, and yes, where we showed that fish are better at reflecting light than a mirror. Their camouflage, especially polarized light, which was surprising because everyone thinks a mirror is a great reflector, but it's not. Hey, yeah? Can you just take a sample and measure that in the lab? Or? You can, but as I said, there's biofilms, there's air-water interface issues with your lamp coming in and light coming out at this angle, and you know, it's not, it's a little harder. You can, and I've, I've done that, but it's very destructive, yeah? But how do you handle it when you're in green waters and you actually just don't have any blue light coming down? So you really can't, mm. even if you have Ks, you can't really measure the reflectance if you have no right. light at those ends of the So sun. you can have a sensor with, a, with light right. and it's closed path, but it's not an up-down sensor because how would you do that? So I just, uh, how do you measure? Hmm. So this is basically, I'm a terrible graphic artist, but this is the central concept, right? You put a spectral on, you have your sediment, you have a probe. In general, we use an L probe so we know we're just getting one direction of light. This is 100% reflective. How, what, how reflective is this? Now there's issues here because spectralon is really bright and we don't use it in our ocean above water measurements either. We use a gray plaque. But corals and some sediments are pretty bright so you have to sort of know, you don't want to saturate your sensor. So what color spectralon you use. And we're just finishing a paper on calibrating gray plaques underwater because they're not exactly as spectrally flat gray, especially going into the near infrared as we like. Secondly, you get bubbles on the plaque and you have to clear those off. So just some subtleties, but in general, this is the method that works quite well. You have the probe, same height, you have spectralon, same height, you have your surface, you ratio the two. As long as you're not in Port Aransas, where you've got a lot of this scattering into your sensor, and it's much smaller, you, you pretty, pretty good measurement. The other would be a light source where you close the path. Just takes a lot more time and you have, you, you know, the, you have to design your sensor so you don't get glint. So you wouldn't have your light looking straight down or you're glinting. So the light's often at an angle and your probe's at the top and you're sort of getting a sense there. Anybody have any questions? Ideally, you would like to do this as well for different sun elevations, I guess. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it's fairly diffuse under there, but yes. Then you, at, in general, for remote sensing, we're interested in what's 
uh, coming sort of up in an angle that would then leave the sea surface. So, um, but yes, there can be some adjustments. So here's our example. This is me and this is my student Brandon and we're like, let's do this coral wall in Palau. Oh no, Curacao, sorry. We have a slate. It helps to have two people if you really want to know what your substrate is. You don't want to touch it too much. Oh. Okay, so then you have your camera. You take a little picture of what you're doing. You often take a picture of your sheet so you know what number you are. See, he's made the mistake. I always put weights on my ankles. Very important or you get cramps in your legs. There's some nice weights there. It helps a lot. So we did the plaque, and in this case, we're using gray. And we did the substance. We kept the plaque. We generally remove the plaque like this carefully. Uh, and then we move on. How do you get the plaque horizontal? Yeah, carefully. It's hard. In certain things, you try to pick a horizontal spot. Um, that's the best you can do, or hold it in such a way. Or you could put a level on it, but it, you know, that's a uh, level underwater. So it's not perfect, but it is one way um, where you, this is my best case where I, I didn't know this was going to be filmed for all of posterity, but I am holding it. I, it's practice. Even with above water measurements, I have my students hold their plaque so flat we practice in the lab until it's flat. Um, it's a, a fiber optic, is it? Yeah. In this case, we have a fiber optic. Um, now he's saying that was good. We hit the right buttons. Let's move on. All right, so small field of view, many different targets. All right, so getting to the question, I think Hudley talked about BRDF. Um, Obviously, bottom is not Lambertian. Uh, but Mobley has a nice paper, 2003, which says, eh, for most remote sensing, within the errors of like 10%, which at this point, when you have a factor of three of seagrass and you're, you know, it's not horrible to assume that the sub substrate's Lambertian. So we generally do it, but if you want to get you know, a uh, dense canopy is nearly flat, but a sparse canopy where you have the canopy sort of arching over, you get pretty serious BRDF. That means the angle off of, depends on the angle that you're looking at this substrate. Top is different from side. Um, and then just their specular reflection. This, we try to remove that. This is just from sunlight, so it can have a little specular, but it's not like a lamp where you're shining down on a target, which I don't recommend. Even if you set up laboratory imaging, you either have to have an imager and get rid of the glint pixels, but if you just take a lamp and you measure reflectance off a target, you're going to get a lot of glint, so, so I don't recommend that. Okay. Plant matter like this, anyone recognize this leafy wonder? Sargassum. You know, you can collect that. You can do some target measurements in the air. It's floating. It might have some residual water on it. But you get a pretty good sense of the canopy. Uh, and some of these things you can do in air if they're not super fibrous, like they have water filled, uh, like a leafy ulva or something, you, that would be hard to do. Um, and so what you can see here is the syringodium. This is seagrass rack, and this is sargassum. And spectrally, this is where you would, even just taking a Landsat, you might not have the bands that you would be able to say, is that seagrass floating? Is that sargassum floating? Is that trichodesmium floating? Is that, you know, all these different targets have this red edge of reflectance, uh, but this is where knowledge is required, right, to be able to say um, hyperspectrally, is there something sort of unique to this signal? 
So you can infer it like, I know my area. I'm far enough out. It's not trichodesmium. It's not a cyanobacterial mat. I think it's sargassum. But some of these little features, this is chlorophyll C that absorbs here. Pretty good to say. Well, it's something with that pigment, so it's not seagrass rack, you know, that kind of thing. All right. Why do you say you use black rubber and not cloth? Oh, no. This is uh, in our standards paper we're coming out. Black cloth is vegetative. It has a wicked red edge. Okay. So if you have this and you're interested in the near infrared and you have this big, bright, vegetative black cloth, it's, it's totally not appropriate. But we've tried every black substance now. So there's neoprene's good and rubber. It's really good. And there's some black paint you can buy that JPL uses on all their specifically non-reflective. Cloth is plant matter, and you have a red edge. It's just not good. So I don't recommend it. OK. So the final topic for today's is just why do we care about reflectance in and of itself? Uh, we can measure it. We can see it. Um, so this is really early work. I think you guys might have had this paper online. I grant you this isn't the world's best um, regression. But it was one way to say, like, this bank, how much net primary production can be happening on different parts of the bank? Can we come up with a number, a grams of carbon, that these net banks produce um, for the different types, sand and mud, grapestone, red algae, brown algae, and seagrasses? And often, the benthic reflectance level is, can be related to net primary production. So that's one useful thing. It's not perfect, but it's better than zero, right? Uh, did you guys see this before? No. So we've just run this uh, John's model in the last year. This is in our uh, 2015 paper. Uh, we ran it with different leaf positions, leaf lengths, and leaf areas filled in. And then we said, basically, OK, I'm looking at a canopy, do you think I can go from a canopy of zero leaf in to like 20 leaf area index? You know, like a really dense can. Like how dense can a canopy be observed? And moreover, how much air gets introduced by leaf length, leaf position, and so forth. So this is one of the first quantitative studies where we came up with this. Um, so leaf area index is used in the vegetation community. Everyone understands it's the length of leaf by the width of leaf by the density in a meter squared. So it's meter squared of leaf per meter squared of seafloor, meter squared of one-sided leaf. Uh, so this is reflectance. This is at 555 or 550. Um, and so what you can see for this simulation with a certain sediment and a certain type of seagrass, how you would read that is if I model reflectance or measure it, and I get 10%, which was Henry's sediment. Um, this is seagrass and sediment. I could say to within of it, the LAI is between 2 and 3. Um, so we can estimate the leaf area index based on mid, long, short with some error turn. Um, so it can be a range of uh, leaf area indexes. And then basically, if you get much darker than that, you could be, you just saturate. You have a full tropical jungle canopy and analogous in the water. Um, so basically, where this asymptotes will kind of be 100% sand, so it makes a difference. This whole curve can change depending on what kind of sand you're in. Um, and John's redoing it now with the uh, cylindrical canopies uh, and some mixtures. Um, so
So the other thing that you can do is relate the bottom reflectance to the symbiont or pigment density. And I know these aren't all great relationships, but this is the first time we've done, uh, this is integrated reflectance related to symbiont density. This is from my student Brandon Russell's uh, paper recently. You know, we're, we're still working on refining and other things, but you know, there is a little bit of a relationship when you have brighter reflectance, you're more bleached, you have less symbiont, and when you have a darker coral reflectance, you have more symbiont. Makes sense, it's less bleached. But there is relationships between the two symbionts and differences in the two species. So we're redoing this in Hawaii in um, February, uh, and we'll see what we get uh, sort of in a broader study. Um, and this is a nice paper by Torres Perez, and they also looked at different two species of corals with concentration of pigments in micrograms per centimeter squared, and found for each species there was a relationship uh, area under the reflectance curve. If, if it's dark, uh, if there's a lot of area, it's a brighter reflectance, and so it has less pigment. As it gets darker, you have more pigment. So these are things that actually would be very useful for the ecology community. They could drive around with a benthic spectrometer and sort of say how much symbion are on this reef. Or we can take a remote sensing estimate and say this reef looks OK, has some rough estimate of symbionts or pigments. It's not bleached yet. Any questions so far? But this is all sort of just brand new. So the last couple years, people have been doing this. So it's something you guys should think about. And then finally, another application is we have a hyperspectral imager. And you can image high resolution. This is done in air. but And then this is like a chlorophyll algorithm in the coral. And you can really start to see where the coral pigments are located. They're not on these ridges, but they're in the troughs of the brain coral. And then there's obvious things that aren't um, photosynthesizing. And this kind of thing is pretty cool. And not, not a lot of people have been uh, relating things to the actual physiology of the coral and where they host their pigments and how it looks um, uh, you know, physiologically. So just to recap here, um, the color of the seafloor is really dependent on the bottom type, the benthic. But for some cases, like coral, there's pretty good standard end members, uh, seagrass, algae, sand. If it's bright, like Bahama sand, you're pretty good. But you have to be aware that sand and sediment is really variable. Um, uh, generally, we like to do it in water with the dive spec. Um, and you can do it in a lab, as I said. But you just have to be uh, careful. Um, benthic reflectance can be related to various biogeochemistry. I mean, we don't even know. We're just trying to see where this can go in the broader research community. Um, if we can do this, we could, we could help uh, understand ecology. So that's the, the bottom goal. Any questions? You guys didn't even ask me about atmospheric correction. No, I'm just kidding. That's, that's later. Can, can you extract species information from the BRDF? Of which, yes. Uh, well, we're working on that with John, whether the cylindrical BRDF is different from the flat leafed. The leaves are pretty similar. They're green, and they have a similar look. Um, but um, presumably the canopy structure is quite different. So um, I would suspect that the variations you get due to other things such as the canopy 
position and this type of stuff would probably, especially by the time you get to the top of the water column, um, because obviously the light is more diffuse the deeper the water is, so probably those BRDF effects get very much attenuated in water column, I would think. But that's what we're looking at at the moment. So. All right. Well, I'll be in the back having some coffee if there's something that you're afraid to ask me. Um, we can map some more colors of your shirts and now next time I'll bring a spectrometer you can play with it some samples of coral you know we could um, get a sense for what's going on all right so this afternoon after break here we're gonna do um, remote sensing and the methods for using this benthic reflectance or deriving it I have a question for you about the um, when you were trying to determine whether certain coral species were more thermally tolerant than others. Yeah. How much do you think the um, optical properties of the skeleton of the? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, it can vary, and it's not my main thing, but this, the the um, there are differences in the skeleton as well as in the pigments. Um, aggregated corals often look quite similar. But uh, John, you had uh, one of your colleagues has the paper on the skeleton, right? Yes, and that's Enriquez, the, I don't know if you've seen that paper, but it's to do with the uh, the, the calyx, the cups that the, the corals sit in at the individual polyps, because basically they're like a cup like this, and it's white because it's skeleton, obviously calcium carbonate. So one of the things that tends to happen is when they start to bleach, if they get stressed and they start to lose the symbionts, the symbionts that are left there get even more light because it's like the light scatters inside these white cups here. So it's like a kind of nonlinear effect and they think that that's quite important with the sort of, um, you know, the threshold for bleaching is like when you get there, then it becomes almost like a sort of runaway process or something like that, I think is, is it. And so the different corals have different morphologies, like some of them have very small calyx and some have bigger ones and this type of thing. And you saw from Heidi's slide there with the brain coral how the the chlorophyll the symbionts are kind of in the grooves they're inside the grooves because it's like a light it helps them to capture light but then as soon as the sim if the symbionts start to get um, uh, bleached or well, expelled yeah, exactly then it starts yeah. then it's a bad thing yeah because it's the ones that are left are like dazzled by the bright skeleton around them without their compatriots to absorb the light see, so. so they leave even faster yeah 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 maybe it's a nonlinear. Right, well, uh, thank you.